All right. Charging ahead. No rest for the wicked. Except moving this to another screen. Great. Um, all right. So data wrangling. Data wrangling is a, a kind of weird topic, but it is what you usually end up doing on the command line once you start getting used to it. And that is, you have, you have a bunch of text and you want a different bunch of text. Usually you want less than what you have. For example, uh, my system log, or this is my server system log, has a lot of stuff in it. And it's really annoying to try to find anything in that log because it is super long. You're going to have to condense it down. Um, and the command line is actually really good at giving you tools for narrowing down the stuff that you're looking at. Um, we did a little bit of this in the past lecture, talking a little bit about things like grep uh, that help you do very basic things, and pipe that lets you combine commands. But today we're basically going to look at all the tools that help you um, massage data from one format to another into the kind of form that you want it to be in. Um, we're going to operate basically from my, uh, from my own server log. Um, so in this case, uh, we'll probably cover SSH at some point, uh, but the basic idea is that you can, you can um, basically run a command on a remote machine. So for me, this SSH is to a machine I have in the Netherlands and runs the journal CTL command, uh, which just prints the entire system log. Um, I happen to have done this before, uh, although I could have written all these commands as just piping it through whatever I write next. I'm going to instead use the tsp.log file because that way I don't have to, it has all the same stuff. That way I just don't have to do it all over the network. And if the network cuts out, everything still works. Um, so let's start, let's, let's imagine that we want to look at like SSH stuff. Specifically, my server, because it's public, gets a lot of people trying to log into it. Um, I run my server on an alternative SSH port, which is really nice. It means fewer people try to connect to it. Uh, but I still get lots and lots and lots of visits to that machine. And I sort of want to look at some statistics about it. In particular, let's try to figure out the kind of usernames that people are trying to log into my computer as. Right? Um, now, starting with the log, we might imagine, first of all, that we're just going to grep for SSHD. Actually, let me go to bash because I feel like my history. <laughs> um, right, so we're going to grep for SSHD. And that's still far too much text. Like, this is a lot of noise, especially at this font size, and you don't really know what you're looking for. Um, however, you'll notice that there are these, like, disconnected from messages, right? So this says a username. If we go further up, Disconnected from invalid user. Okay, so it looks like those are lines that contain usernames. So let's actually look for disconnected from and see what we find. All right, that looks a little bit better. So all of the lines that are printed now at least seem to contain usernames. Okay, so that's a start. Um, now, we sort of want to get rid of the other crap that's on this line. Um, and the way you normally do this is using a tool called set. So set is a streaming editor that basically lets you um, write commands that edit a given line in a text file. Um, in this case, we're gonna use set, and we're gonna say we're gonna substitute, and then I'm gonna come back to what this means. This. So notice that what this did was cut off the entire beginning of that line. So if I give you an example, let's do tail and five. So these are the last five lines from the thing above those turned into this, which is a lot shorter, right? So this command said, let's see if I can give you that without all the noise around it. This command, so I piped through said with this argument. So said is a line editor, as I mentioned, and the way it works is you give a bunch of commands that operate on every line of the input. Um, in this case, every line is an a login attempt. And what I'm trying to do is at least remove all the crap at the beginning of the line. And the s command for said um, does that. It substitutes whatever matches the pattern in between the first and the second slash with the contents that are between the second and the third slash. In this case, it's replacing it with nothing, thereby removing it. The stuff that's in between, it's what's known as a regular expression. Um, some of you may have heard of these in the past, some of you may have some experience with them. Um, regular expressions are pretty hairy beasts, but they are really, really useful. Um, and so I'll go through some of the basics, and then there will also, like, I recommend you look them up on your own because they are really handy, uh, and you can do a lot of cool things with them. In particular, um, if you have a regular expression, there are a couple of basic symbols that you're going to end up using a lot. Dot 
means uh, how can you phrase this? Dot. Yeah, dot is fine. Uh, so dot means any single character. It matches any single character, no matter what it is. So it's sort of like question mark when we talked about globbing. Um, star means zero or more of the preceding thing, the preceding pattern, right? So if I write dot star, it means zero or more of any character, right? Which is basically any amount of text. So in the pattern above, when we wrote, um, when we substituted like this, what this really meant is substitute any string of characters followed by the string disconnected from, right? Which was what trims off the entire beginning of the line, including like the date, the host name, the name of the process, the process ID. I didn't have to match those explicitly, I just had any string of characters preceding disconnected from. Um, you also have, so star is zero or more, plus is one or more. So this is convenient if you explicitly want to talk about things that are non empty. Um, you also have square brackets, so if you write something like this in a pattern, it means A or B or C, any single character from that set. Uh, so if I did this, it would be any sequence that is not empty of A's, B's, and C's in any order. Um, you also have patterns like uh, this, where Rx1 and Rx2 are patterns, let's call them P. Um, this means anything that matches either pattern one or pattern two in this location. So if it matches either, then this pattern matches, otherwise it does not. Um, there is also caret, so caret means start of line. Um, and there is dollar sign, which means end of line. These are handy for anchoring matches, saying I want to remove from the end, for example. If I wrote a pattern like um, this, it would mean substitute the foo if it's at the end of the line and substitute it with, that, with nothing. If there were other foos in that line, they would not be removed. Um, and then you get to combine these in interesting ways that, um, that basically let you express really complicated patterns. So we'll see how that turns out by looking more at this log. Um, said, so there are a lot of different implementations of regular expressions. Said uses a particularly ancient one that's a little bit of a pain to use but it is the tool that people most often end up using for this purpose. Um, in general, in said, whenever you use any of these special characters except for dot, uh, star, and square bracket, you need to put a uh, backslash in front of them. So inside a said command, uh, if I wanted to do zero or more A's, uh, one or more B's, and like C or D. If I wanted to write this with said, I'd have to put a backslash before all of these to make them have their special meaning. Uh, this is just something to be aware of that said is a little bit annoying in this way. Um, the other thing you can do if you don't want to write all those things is you can pass the, pass the dash capital E flag to said and then we'll just assume that all special characters are special. Uh, this brings it more in line with regular expressions you might experience in other programming language like Python, Ruby, whatever. Um, okay, so let's look back at what we had up here. Um, so this worked pretty well, this uh, set expression that was like dot star disconnected from to remove the beginning of the line. However, it puts us in a little bit of an awkward spot because what if someone tried to log into my server with the username disconnected from? Right? So uh, let's take an example line from this log. Right? So this, I'm just going to echo that line. Um, and then I'm going to replace the username with disconnected from. So that's the username they tried to log into my server using. Let's see what happens if we now try to use the same thing. So I'm going to ignore the grefs because there's only a single line. And we're going to try to use the same pattern. From with nothing. Uh, it removed the entire username from the line too. This is because star and plus in regexes are greedy by default. They remove as much or they match as much as possible. This means that even though they encounter something that matches, they will keep going and see if they match something else later in the string. Uh, normally, if you have a sane implementation of regular expressions, uh, you can curve this behavior by putting a question mark after a star or a plus. 
And if you do this, you're saying, don't be greedy about this operator. Stop when you hit the first match. Um, unfortunately, um, said is not smart enough to understand that operator. Um, we can switch to using Perl instead. So Perl also has like a line by line editor mode that supports things like substitutions. So if we do that, then you'll see it exhibits the same behavior as, per, as uh, said, but if I put a question mark after the star, then now it keeps the username. It basically does a non-greedy match, right? Um, and so generally, using Perl can be nice in these settings, but said is usually the tool that you have to work with because otherwise you require that the user has a Perl or Python or whatever command line, whereas said is just always installed. It comes with every Linux distribution and Mac OS, and like all of them have said. Um, so the question is, how can we make this better? Well, we're gonna stick with said, and we're gonna see if we can just make the problem go away by ignoring it for long enough, uh, which is often a solution in computer science problems. Um, in particular, let's ignore that problem for now and look at the log that we got so far. Um, it has a bunch of crap at the end of it. Right? So at following this sort of invalid user or authenticating user or user, um, there's an IP address, a port, and some stuff at the end. We want to get rid of that too. We just want the user names. That's all we care about. Um, in order to do that, let's try to remove all the stuff at the end too. So this set expression we had, we're going to extend it to try to match more of the stuff that we have. And here I'm going to add the dash E flag so I don't have to add all the backslashes. Um, in particular, it's going to say something like, Disconnected from uh, invalid or uh, authenticating question mark means zero or one of the preceding thing. So notice that this is saying uh, there's going to be a bunch of stuff at the beginning. Then it's going to say disconnected from. Then it's going to say either invalid space or authenticating space, if at all. That's what the question means. The question mark means uh, followed by user. Right? So this is gonna match anything that says disconnected from invalid user or disconnected from authenticating user or disconnected from user. Any of those are gonna match this pattern. Um, and in fact, we can test it. This removed all the user stuff at the beginning. Right? Now we just, it just starts with the username. Although there's a space there that we can remove by adding a space. Um, and then we're gonna match on the username itself, which we have no idea what it contains. Right? It's any string of characters. Uh, we could use a plus if we want, because we know that it's not empty. Um, and then after that, there's an IP address, right? This business here. And an IP address, we all know, is really just anything that doesn't have a space in it. So you can do this. Uh, square bracket, remember, was a, a set of characters, right? Uh, you can prefix that set with a caret, and that means anything that's not in the set. So what this is saying is, any character that is not a space. Plus of that, so one or more non-space characters, which will match any IP address, because IP addresses can't have spaces in them. And similarly, if there happened to be like an IPv6 address or a host name or something, those would also be matched because they cannot have spaces in them. Um, following that, it says uh, port, and then there's a port number, which we can do zero to nine plus. So, you can also have ranges inside of square brackets. Uh, ranges are any character that is between these three. Uh, so in this case, zero to nine means zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So any of the digits and one or more of those will match all the, all the port numbers that could possibly be there. Uh, and then we'll notice some of the lines have this pre op at the end, but not all of them. Like this one does not have pre op at the end, right? So we want to optionally match on pre op and that's gonna be the end of the line. Uh, let me see if I can give that to you without all the line wrapping, or with more convenient line wrapping, maybe. So, let me make this a little bit smaller. Can we do that? Yay, it worked. Um, all right, so this pattern, it looks pretty complicated, but you sort of see how we constructed it, right? We sort of piece by piece go through what's in the line and how do we want that to be different. So at the end here, what I ended up adding was 
optionally, right? Remember this is a parent with a question mark. So this is saying either have the literal string space open square bracket. Notice the backslash now is saying don't treat this as special. Um, so square bracket, pre op and square bracket. Either that or not that, followed by the end of the line. And you'll see that if I run this, I get lots of empty lines. Now why is that? Well, it's because what we told set to do was replace anything that matches with the empty string. Right? But we actually sort of want to keep the username, otherwise this is pretty useless. Uh, it turns out regular expressions can support this too, using something called capture groups. So anything, any pattern that's enclosed in parentheses is automatically sort of saved by the engine. So in this case, if I put parentheses around this dot plus, which was the username, and notice that this hasn't changed the pattern at all. Right? The pattern still matches the same thing, because parentheses don't match anything in and of themselves. Um, but this causes the thing that's matching to remember whatever was, whatever was matched by the stuff that's inside that parentheses. And you can refer to that by using backslash and the, the ordinal number of the parentheses. So remember, there's one parentheses here, that will be assigned to backslash one. There's one parentheses here, that will be backslash two. And there's one parentheses here, that will be backslash three. So in this case, what we want to do is substitute with backslash two, right? Because backslash two is where the username that make sense? Right, because the backslash one is gonna be whether it's said invalid or authenticating or nothing. And backslash three is gonna be whether it's said pre-auth or not. The backslash two is the thing we just added, which is gonna mark the username. So if we run this, we get the actual usernames. And now let's reflect on what happens if someone chose the username disconnected from. Because we've told this that it has to match the entire line, this, if it said disconnected from as the username, that disconnected from would not match this disconnected from at the beginning of the pattern, right? Because it has to be followed by invalid authenticating user and the IP address and the port and pre-auth and then the end of the line, right? So this pattern actually gets rid of the entire problem of the user using a weird username, accidentally or on purpose, I won't tell you. Um, and uh, it turns out that there are some really good tools for dealing with this. So if I can, who knows how this is going to work? Dot it, uh, GitHub dot io. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Maybe. Resolvers. So I've linked to this tool called Regex One Hundred One. So this is an online regular expression tester. And so here I've put in this entire pattern and it will tell you how the pattern works. So it will sort of explain the pattern to you in plain English and then you can give it test strings and see what matches what. So in this case, if I put the friends back around the user here, it will also highlight the capture groups, right? So invalid here is capture group one, uh, WP user is capture group two, and pre op is capture group three. So this is a handy way to debug your regular expressions if they're not quite matching what you thought they would be, right? Uh, and it will tell you like where are all the groups, which of these strings match them how. The, I've linked this in the, in the lecture notes, so feel free to check that out there. Um, all right, so back to this. Now we have this list of usernames. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm not gonna cover too much more about regular expressions, except to say that they can get really, really hairy. Um, so there's one other thing I wanted to show you, which was uh, regex email. So it turns out you can write regular expressions to match nearly everything. Uh, like you can match any um, email that's valid according to the RFC, but it's not entirely straightforward. So if this works, maybe. I can't zoom in anymore. Ah, apparently I could. <laughs> right, so look at this regular expression. This matches a valid email address according to the RFC. You probably don't want to write it yourself, but regular expressions can do a lot of really cool things, like, this regular expression right here will, if you take any number and you print that many ones of it, 
and then you match it against this regular expression, it will tell you whether or not that number is a prime. It's amazing that this is possible, but it is. Regular expressions can do a lot of stuff, but because they have this flexibility, they're also sometimes a real pain to try and beat. And this is why I will not cover everything about regular expressions, because I don't think I physically could. Um, so we're going to continue just from sort of now we have the usernames. Yes? Can you do this search inside a file? Like, can you do all of this to look inside, for example? Like, if you didn't have this log, I have like a JSON. Yeah? I mean, I'm just counting the file at the beginning here, right? So I could, whatever file I had, I could totally run this on. Um, if you're on the command line and you have tools that aren't text files, there are usually very good tools for extracting data from those files to, to text. So if you have JSON, for example, is a tool called JQ. Um, JQ, in one of the exercises, I basically asked you to try to figure out how to use JQ, uh, but it lets you write patterns to extract data from JSON. There's also one called PUP, which is great for extracting stuff from HTML. Uh, and there are tools for like dealing with CSV files. Um, all of this, like, there are good tools for it. In general, all of the tools I'm teaching you here are more the sort of things you compose once you have your data source, right, in some meaningful format. Um, all right, so we have usernames. Great. Let's see if we can do anything interesting with them. Um, All right, so I have these like grepts at the beginning which are kind of bothering me. Um, I mentioned that sed is, um, is like a line editor and it turns out sed is really powerful. It basically has a complete built-in programming language. Uh, so I don't actually need these. In fact, I don't even really need the cat. Um, I can do this only with sed. I don't think normally you would want to do this. Uh, so with said, you can write multiple expressions by giving dash e. So each thing that follows the dash e is a separate expression, and they're run in sequence, and each one modifies the line before the next expression is run on that line. Um, so one of the things that I can do is I can say that any line that uh, matches sshd is not deleted. In fact, sed has a lot of really powerful tools, like it can inject lines into the file. We've also already seen substitutions, but it can inject lines above, below, it can sample lines that are nearby. Um, most people don't know all the things sed can do, and that's partially because if you look at the man page for sed, these are the kind of commands that you get. They're all single character commands that are combined in really awkward ways, but you can do cool things if you look really carefully. In fact, if you want to give yourself a challenge, I suggest you try to do some of the exercises using only sed as your data management tool. Uh, it's going to feel painful, but it's possible. All right, so we have this command that gives us all the usernames. Um, and that's all well and good. Um, but let's see if we can get something more interesting out of this. So in particular, let's try to look at uh, usernames that people are commonly using. Right, so if we type this through wc-l, which is uh, word count, and the dash l means count the number of lines. Um, so this is telling me that there are 3,595 usernames uh, since the last reboot of my machine that have tried to log in. Um, but presumably all of those usernames aren't distinct. So let's try to find out like which ones are people using and which are being used more than once or, or commonly. Um, so there's a tool called sort. If you pipe things to sort, it will sort the inputs. Uh, it will give you the lines, the input lines in sorted order in the output. So now all the things that are the same are next to each other. And then there's another tool called unique, uh, not fully spelled out. Most of Linux command line utilities have names that are four characters or shorter for various historical reasons. Um, uh, unique will normally just print um, for any, any, uh, any line that does not have other lines that are the same as it, right? So for example, it would only print Zimbra once, right? It only, for any consecutive sequence of lines, so it does not look everywhere in the input, just consecutive lines, it will only print one if there are many. 
Um, it will also, if you print, use the dash C flag, it will give you a count for each one. So in this case, uh, we'll see that Zimbra was used 11 times, Zabbix was used 23, whereas Zakartotya, it was only used once, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, this is still not very helpful though. This isn't really telling me what the most common one is, right? Um, I sort of want the ones that have the highest count towards the bottom or towards the top. There's any way I can get that done. And so we're going to pipe through sort again. Um, sort has also surprisingly, or perhaps unsurprisingly, a lot of really useful command line arguments. Um, it has dash n, which sorts in numerical instead of lexicographic order. Uh, it has dash k, which lets you sort only by a given field of the input. So normally, it will sort by the entire line, which in this case would be fine because the number is first, uh, but you could totally imagine that the numbers aren't first, and I'm trying to teach you general tools, uh, so we're going to use dash k. Dash k is really stupid in how it's organized. Uh, this is the argument you have to give to sort by only the first field. Um, the first thing that follows k is a one index of the first column you want to sort by, and the comma one says stop when you reach column one. Otherwise, it sorts by all the columns until the end of the line. Uh, this means you can do something like 1, 2. This sorts by the first two columns. 1, 3 does not sort by columns 1 and 3. It sorts by the first three columns, which is stupid. There are ways to make it sort only by like 1 and 3 by using stable sorts, but it's a pain. But 1, 1 is generally what you want, uh, or something like 3, 3, which would sort by the third column. No, the 3, 1 is not what you want anymore. Um, so 1, 1, now we're going to get this sorted by the count. So you'll see that perhaps unsurprisingly, most of the logins are from me. Um, there are also a bunch of login attempts from root, admin, test, user, etc., and various common usernames. As you scroll further up, you see less common usernames. Um, and we probably only want to look at the most popular ones of these. So let's do something like tail, um, dash n 10. So this will print the, print the 10 lowest lines in the output, in this case, the 10 most popular. Um, if I wanted the top, I could do head, uh, I could also reverse sort, so put the highest valued things on top, and this gives me the same output, except in the opposite order. Or, of course, I could, instead of giving the dash r flag, I could use tack, which prints its input in opposite order, and that gives me the same thing. But that's all unnecessary, so let's just stick with tail and ten. Um, okay, so now we have the tail, which is what we wanted, but let's... Uh, try to do something more interesting. Um, let's, in this case, just show the usernames. We don't need the counts anymore now. We just want the usernames. We're going to use a separate tool called awk. So awk uh, is another editor. Um, it is also a line-oriented editor, but the reason you sometimes want to use awk instead of set is that awk knows about fields. So awk does not just operate on lines, it operates on the fields of that line. Uh, in particular, with awk, I can do this. Uh, let's actually rewrite this line. Um, so let's talk about paste first. Um, paste takes uh, its inputs as lines and pastes them together by the character that follows D. So in this case, instead of getting a list of usernames, I'll get a comma separated list of usernames. It's really handy because you can do things like um, use plus as the delimiter and then pipe into a calculator and then it will compute the sum of them. Or you could delimit them by multiply and then pipe it through a calculator and now you're multiplying them. In this case, I just wanted it not to be as many lines. Uh, and this will indeed give me all the usernames. Uh, I might actually just want the most recent ones. And it gives me them comma separated, right? Uh, so what does awk do? What is this awk print to business? Well, awk is also line oriented. Um, and in awk, every, uh, every part of awk is a combination of an optional pattern uh, followed by a block. The pattern is saying, if this pattern matches, then execute the code in this block. Um, if you leave out the pattern, it matches every line. Within a block and within the pattern, um, you have access to a number of variables. $0 is the entire line that you're currently on. 
dollar one is the first field of that line. Dollar two is the second field, dollar three is the third, etc. By default, awk will split by white space, any sequence of white space, and it will trim the white space at the beginning and end of the line. So that is why, in this case, dollar two ends up being the second field in the output from unique, which is the username instead of the count. Right? If I made this print dollar one, it would print the count instead of the username. Um, you can also change what delimiter is being used by using uh, dash f and then giving a different character. So for example, if you wanted to parse CSV files, you could do this, and now you can operate on awk with the field being comma separated. Or if it was tab separated, you could do this. Not that you can see that that's a tab, but that is a tab. Um, I think you can also do like this, the syntax in bash, I think. Um, for saying a tab, uh, I could have a new line separated field list. I could have whatever, right? Um, the reason this is really neat is like this was a pretty simple example. Uh, awk is nice for just like if you're extracting a single column, but there are other tools that can do that better. Um, but awk is really powerful. And I'll try to give you an example of why. Um, let's say that we want to find all of the usernames that are used only once and that start with the letter C and end with the letter E. In awk, this is trivial. So um, we're now going to take the entire list of usernames and counts. Um, I mean, now I'm going to add a condition. And that condition is going to be that the first field is one, so that is the count. And also, uh, the second field matches the following regular expression. It starts with a C. Um, it then has any amount of non-space uh, non characters. And then it ends with an E. Um, and if that pattern matches, then print two. And that gives me all the usernames whose count is one and whose that matches the pattern C. And this is any regular expression that I might want to write, right? So this makes it really easy to work with columnar data, and usually what you end up with on the command line is columnar data in one way or another. Like for example, if I type the output of PS, which lists all the processes uh, on my machine, uh, then this is also columnar, right? So here, I could pipe this through awk and say that I want anything uh, that is, say, run by root, and where the process ID is greater than 2,000. Uh, then I want to print uh, the four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I want to print its runtime. Right? So awk makes it really easy to express things in terms of columns. Uh, back to this though, I can pipe this and this, and it will tell me, wow, there were four usernames, as if I couldn't tell that from this. Um, of course, I could also say anything that's not single use. It will tell me there's only one. And I could have it print out, if I wanted to, both the count and the number for the list. Um, all right, so what else kind of stuff can you do with awk? Well, what I showed you previously was, was uh, I was piping this through wc-l, right? But again, awk is a programming language. We don't need other tools. I could have replaced this entire command line with an awk script, but I'm not going to do that because I don't want to do that to myself. Um, but awk lets you write multiple uh, patterns and blocks in a single expression. There's a special pattern begin that matches before it starts running, where I have variables. So I can say rows is zero. Notice there's nothing in between here. Awk just, it's always just pattern and conditional, uh, sorry, pattern and block. Okay, so uh, let's just say things that start with C. So what this is saying is first, at the very beginning, set a variable called rows to zero. Then for every line where the count is not one, so this is a username that's been used at least once, and the username starts with C, then add the number of occurrences, right, dollar one is the number of occurrences from unique dash C, uh, two rows, and at the end, print rows. So this will give me 
the number of times a username that has been used more than once and starts with C has been used. 64. Not that that's a stat I particularly know what it means or care about, but hopefully the sort of way the program was structured kind of makes sense. This is an entirely arbitrary statistic that I chose to compute. Um, right. Um, I've linked also a sort of guide to introductory awk because again, awk is also one of those languages that it's a complete programming language that I'm not going to teach you, but this has hopefully taught you the sort of basics of how you might use it in, in uh, some kind of data wrangling pipeline. Um, okay, so let's talk about things that are a little bit different um, just because it's handy. I already mentioned, mentioned uh, this idea of paste uh, and using that to do math. So for example, uh, remember how we found out that there were we found out that there were uh, 3,595 login attempts to my machine. Um, let's try to compute that a different way that is more inconvenient. Because why not? So you need to actually see, um, remember it gives us the count for every username that occurs. Uh, and so the sum of all the counts should be the same as the number of total occurrences, right? Let's check that that's the case, just to you know, check math. So we're gonna extract with awk um, just the count, right? That did indeed give me just the count. Um, then we're gonna paste that by plus, and we're gonna pipe that to bc, so that's gonna look like this. And then we're gonna pipe that to bc, which for a stupid reason, requires the dash L flag. And hey, that gives us the same number. The same number. Um, I could also do something like, I want to multiply that number by two. So I can use process substitution for this, right? Remember our friend, process substitution? Right? So this is saying, I'm going to print this string. It's going to be two times, and then substitute out this entire command, which is going to be all those pluses we saw above, and then take that entire thing and send it through the calculator. That's not at all what I, oh, I'm missing an open <laughs> I want two times the entire number, maybe. Great, again, okay, that's, that's better. <laughs> don't care about multiplying the first number. Um, and uh, this might not have been particularly interesting, but we can also do things like compute statistics about our data, which is arguably more important. So remember, this gives us all the counts, right? Let's say that I want some statistics about this. There are lots of really cool command line tools that will just like, you can just pipe stuff into and then you get statistics out. But some of you might know, like there's a program language called R, which is really good at doing statistical analysis. Well, you can pipe things into R too. So what we're gonna use is R's slave mode, which basically lets you uh, run R and then send stuff to it and have it compute and print things for you. Um, and I'm going to run the following program in R. Scan file is standard in, right? So remember standard in from last time. Uh, quiet is true because I don't want it to print anything when it's scanning. And then print me a summary of the resulting. So X in this case is going to be basically an array in R uh, or a single column matrix of all of the data points that we have. In this case, all of the, all of the counts and then it's gonna print me a statistical summary of that data. So it's telling me, well, the minimum and the median are both one. So that means like most of the numbers are, or most of the usernames only have a count of one. Um, the mean is four, the max is 575, that was me, remember? And the third quartile was two. I could print other things too, like if I wanted to, I could get like standard deviation. Uh, SD maybe? Okay, so. If you care, the standard deviation of that list of numbers is 28.36, right? Um, in fact, you can also do plotting. So let's do, uh, we're gonna go back to sorting this again because I don't want all the data points. Uh, we're gonna print out those and we're gonna do tail and 10. I want the user. Uh, I want a bar plot of this, don't you? 
So um, GNU plot is not the best plotting tool, but it is really convenient for command line plotting. of the 10 most common login by username and account, right? Uh, this is useful for just like quick visualizations of data. It is not what you should use to actually plot things uh, if you're like writing a paper or something. Um, R has a really good plotting package called ggplot2, which I recommend you use uh, if you ever end up doing this. Um, but this is a really, really neat tool. Um, as for the syntax for new plot, um, so, it, you can sort of ignore the thing at the beginning, that's just to make it look nicer. Um, GNU plot is basically plot, followed by a dash, which signifies standard in, like in the other command line tools that we talked about. Um, using, and then you write the which column of the input data should be used as the x-axis, and which column of the input data should be used as the y-axis. Uh, and then you can say like with lines, with boxes, with points, however you would like to plot that data. Uh, and then the Dash E is saying execute this program as the GNU plot program, and dash P is make it permanent on my screen, like don't close it the moment the input finishes. Um, so that gets us pretty far. We're also gonna talk a little bit about um, how the command line can be useful outside of just like plotting and looking at data. So one command I actually ended up running earlier today, ooh, but now it's um, so there's a tool called RustUp, which um, manages uh, your like Rust installations. So you can have multiple versions of the compiler installed at the same time. There are similar tools in Python, Ruby, whatever. Um, and it has this thing called a tool chain. So a tool chain is one list of the one version of the compiler, and I can list all the versions. Um, I happen to have a bunch of these different old nightlies lying around, and I wanted to get rid of some of the old ones. And I ended up doing basically data wrangling. So I grep for nightly, right? Because I wanted to only remove things that are nightly. Um, then I did not want to remove the current nightly, which is the one that's just named, uh, the one at the bottom that doesn't have a date in it, right? So I did not want to match that. Um, and then in order to remove them, I have to remove them by giving the name, but not this entire prefix. <laughs> so I want to substitute everything from dash x86 and onwards, right? Ooh. Oh, substitute with nothing. So that gives me currently only the, the one nightly that's here in the, in the, when I last ran this, there were like 20 lines here. Um, and then XARGs is a really, really handy tool for saying, take all of the lines of my input and make them arguments to the following command. So for example, if I do XARGs echo, that's gonna end up calling echo with the argument of the input. How do I demonstrate this in the best possible way? Uh, Hello? No, not gonna. Mm. Sure, ls. So in this case, um, ls was given the argument nightly, right? And it says no such file directory. And in my case, what I wanted to do with this was rust, rust up tool chain uninstall. So now that's gonna run the command rust up tool chain uninstalled with the argument of the particular compiler that I want to remove. In fact, it's gonna run it with all of them, all of the different nightlies that I want to remove. So instead of going through and removing all of them one by one, this command line lets me have the machine do all the work for me, instead of me like copying and pasting and whatnot. And this is what um, data wrangling open gives you. It gives you these really convenient ways for expressing things that would otherwise be a lot of manual Oftentimes, you might want to end up with data that you're just gonna like stick in Excel or some other programming language to do actual data analysis on. Um, but sort of the shell script, the shell data wrangling is handy for getting to that point in the first place when all you have are some like fundamental logs. Um, I think that's all I wanted to cover um, sort of at a high level. Part of the reason for this was because if you have more questions about regular expressions, or awk, or sed, or data analysis. Uh, I wanted to have some time to go through those. Um, or like playing around with the, um, uh, with the visual debugger. 
I have more things I can tell you about regular expressions that are useful, uh, but I figured I'd field some questions if some of you, if any of you have any so far. Anything that you are wondering how you might be able to do? So um, at the bottom of the data wrangling page, there are a bunch of exercises too, and some of them are really neat. Um, for example, they're telling you to like do particular things with the logs in your machine. Um, there are some that are doing like word analysis. So most of your computers are gonna come with this uh, word list in user share dict words that has just words uh, because sometimes it's useful to have a list of words. Um, so well, there's some like data wrangling exercises on those. Um, there's also, so someone asked earlier about like analyzing data that's not just textual data, but that's like JSON, HTML, those kind of things. And so there's an exercise in trying to extract uh, particular information using those tools. Um, so JQ. Um, and there's also sort of some challenges in how can you do things with fewer commands? Right? Like how can you extract both the maximum and the minimum, for example, using a single command? And often this will entail using some of the bash tricks that we've talked about in the shell lecture last time. Um, so for pup, for example, pup basically lets you write Great. Um, so in this case, it's just why? Okay, so um, it lets you curl so curl is a command that um, will access a website and download all of its source code, all of its HTML, uh, and then just prints it to send it out. And this is really handy for doing things like data wrangling, or just for fetching a script online. You might, for example, have seen uh, pages that tell you, just run like mywebsite.com slash install, and pipe it through it like sudo sh. Right? <laughs> like there are lots of install, install instructions that will tell you to do this, for example, Just run this command. Some of you might at this point realize that this is not a great idea. What this is doing is it's downloading a script off of the internet and sending that script into your shell and telling the shell, just run whatever, whatever's in there, I'm sure it's fine. Uh, you may not want to do this, uh, but at least now you know what that does and probably why you shouldn't do it. In any case, uh, curl is a really handy tool because what it does is it gives you the source code, but usually that's just like a bunch of HTML tags, right? So this is what the HTML tags of this particular page looks like. This is a mess to try to parse out with regular expressions or grepts and sets, right? Trying to parse this would be a pain. Instead, you can use pub, which um, takes a standard input HTML code, and then you can write selectors. Uh, for those of you who know CSS, these are CSS selectors. Um, so in this case, this is saying, uh, find every table, and every table that's contained inside of one of those tables, Find the table row that is the uh, every third row starting from the bottom. Find the column of that row whose class name is title and find the link inside of it. And then give me the contents of those tags. Try and parse this using regular expressions would be a pain, whereas this actually parses the HTML and gives you the, the appropriate stuff. But you can even extract things like attributes, so in this case, it's extracting the uh, target of all of the A's, so all the anchors, all the links in the page. Similarly, JQ is a tool for operating with uh, JSON files. Uh, Great. So again, they're sort of given this example of you want to curl something. Uh, curl just gives you, in this case, is going to give you some JSON back. So JSON is the JavaScript data notation. It has all the like those squiggly brackets. Um, and JQ similarly lets you write selectors for extracting data from JSON. So in this case it's saying um, extract the following parts of objects. Um, so you can subset things, you can also say extract only the following attribute of like every item of an array. Um, so that what you end up with is not JSON but it's like line separated text for example. And once you get the line separated text, then you can start to combine that with all the tools that we've talked about today to do other interesting stuff with it, right? Um, so, um, for example, 
This is one of the things that I link to on the website. These are various like open data sets that you can find on the web. Um, many of them come in like CSV or JSON or whatever. Um, and extracting these, sure, quality of care, why not? Download CSV flat files, right? So these CSV files, we now know that we could just like operate on using all. Right, dash f comma is going to give you the. Oh, this is a file. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so so some of the exercises here are try to like download some of these data sets and try to do like interesting stuff with them. It doesn't have to be information that you care about, but just to get exercise in how to do this data manipulation. Because the way this ends up being convenient for you is to do it over and over so that you sort of immediately remember what kind of commands you end up writing. Very often, you're just like combining the same types of things. You're like grepping, and then you're setting to remove the stuff on either end, and then you're walking to get fields, and then you're like pasting it together in some, some useful fashion. Um, in that case, if there are no more questions, I think we'll probably end it there, unless you have other things you want me to go through. No? All right, nice. Thanks for coming. Uh, next time we're doing editors and version control. Is that right? Yeah, nice. So we'll talk about Vim and Git. <laughs>